Uh, this hearing of the Subcommittee on Government Organization Efficiency and Financial Management will come to order. First, uh, I want to apologize to uh, my colleagues, our witness, and others for the delay in starting. Uh, typically, have about an hour and forty, hour and forty-five minute commute. And today was about two forty, maybe two forty-five, and uh, thankfully, hope all the individuals who were in the accidents that I passed are safe. And glad I was not in them, but apologize for keeping you waiting. But we are glad to be here today for this important oversight hearing. Uh, I want to thank um, our witness for being here today uh, to discuss efforts to collect delinquent debt owed to the Federal Government. While this is certainly a financial management issue, it also is an accountability issue. Part of accountability is making sure that people fulfill their obligations, whether those obligations are to pay a fine, a penalty, or to repay a Federal loan or to pay child support. Each and every day, the people of Treasury's Debt Management Service do all they can to demand accountability while being sensitive to the rights and circumstances of debtors. This hearing coincides with the release of the Fiscal Year 2010 Annual Debt Report, which provides a detailed look at Treasury's activities. We look forward to discussing that report as well as some of the proposals in the President's budget. We are honored here today to have Mr. David Liebrich with us, Mr. Or Commissioner Liebrich. Uh, is Commissioner of the United States Department of the Treasury's Financial Management Service. As Commissioner, he provides leadership, policy direction, and guidance for financial management programs, including payments collections, debt collection, and government-wide accounting and financial reporting. Commissioner Liebrich, I appreciate you submitting your written testimony here today and uh, have had the chance to review that as well as the report. And, um, also appreciated your reference to uh, our uh, joint predecessor for uh, former Chairman Towns and myself in uh, referencing uh, Chairman Horn. Uh, it was uh, quite an honor to serve with him when I first came to Congress in 2000, and uh, he was a great leader of this subcommittee as well as on a number of efforts, as you referenced in your statement. As the author of the Debt Collection Improvement Act, Chairman Horn uh, certainly worked tirelessly on this issue that we are going to talk about here today, and uh, certainly honored to follow in his footsteps in continuing his efforts uh, in, in partnering with you and my colleagues. I uh, also want to thank you for your service uh, in general. Uh, as one who believes in the ideals of public service, appreciate what you give back to our country and our fellow citizens. Um, Ranking Member and I uh, look forward to working with you uh, along with our committee, subcommittee colleagues uh, and being partners uh, in this important effort of achieving accountability for the American people. Uh, now recognize the Ranking Member, Mr. Towns from New York, for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for arranging this hearing. As this Congress continues to debate the Nation's budget, we are looking to identify sensible cost-cutting measures and ways to increase revenue to the Federal Government. This hearing considers the collection of debt owed to the Government, which is an important revenue stream in these tough economic times. I thank the Chairman for for holding this hearing. Collection of Federal Government and State debt is an essential way to help fund government operations, maintain key programs, and help reduce the Federal deficit. It is also an extremely effective method of collecting delinquent child support obligations to help meet the needs of the children who depend on that support. In the years since this subcommittee began examining debt collection, there has been great improvement. The Treasury Department has taken the tools that the Congress provided in the Debt Collection Improvement Act of 1996 and has expanded its reach to increase the volume of delinquent debt in the government recoups. From 1996 to the end of FY 2010, Financial Management and Services has collected more than $49.7 billion for Federal and State agencies. This is a commendable result compared to the collection level before 1996. Treasury continues to improve its offset and cross-servicing programs, FMS, has ramped up its efforts in collecting delinquent tax and non-tax debt owed by Federal employees. The doctors and hospitals who receive Medicare payments and Federal contractors, they are working 
on identifying other payments that the government can target for collection. There is more than $625 billion in outstanding debts to the government. We are actively collecting $422 billion of that balance. In FY 2010, we actually recovered $5.3 billion. It is clear, Mr. Chairman, that there is much more work that needs to be done. And I am looking forward to the testimony today of our witness. Uh, and, of course, as a result of this, I hope we can continue to move forward as we have done over the last few years. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. I am anxious and eager to hear from my witness. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Uh, we will now proceed to uh, Commissioner Liebrich. And, uh, Commissioner, as the kind of the practice and rules of uh, the House, we swear in every witness. So if I could ask you to stand and raise your right hand. Uh, do solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I so the uh, clerk will note that the witness answered, answered in the affirmative and uh, would uh, like you to proceed. And, and uh, uh, we're, we have seven minutes on the clock, but if you need a little more as the only witness, uh, we are certainly glad to give you some additional time. I will try to stay within that time frame. Chairman, thank you. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify for you, before you today on something which we take very seriously, and that is the collection of delinquent debt owed to the Federal Government. I ask that my entire statement be read into the record. Thank you. Um, I, Chairman, uh, Congressman Horn was a tremendous champion of the Debt Collection Improvement Act in 1996, and so I wanted to spend a moment and pay our respects to him for the efforts that he did. We had a lot of spirited conversations with Chairman Horn uh, during those early years, and uh, we all shared a very common objective, and that was to make sure we were doing the best interest of the American taxpayer. Uh, and uh, he was really quite a champion of this act and the work that we are doing at FMS, and we are very much appreciative of that. This marks the 15th anniversary of the Debt Collection Improvement Act, uh, and a lot has been accomplished in that time. Uh, I want to thank you again for holding this hearing uh, to demonstrate Congress's interest in the Federal Government's activities. Um, I also want to commend the leadership of you, Chairman Platts, and Mr. Towns for your interest in our operations. We look forward to that continued partnership and working together to improve uh, the things that we do. We are proud of the role that we play uh, in providing this essential service to the Federal Government and to the citizens that we serve. We take that responsibility quite seriously, and we, a great, we place a great deal of importance, importance on demonstrating value to the American public in carrying out our responsibilities. Um, FMS collects delinquent debt on behalf of Federal and State agencies in accordance with the Debt Collection Improvement Act and other applicable laws. We embrace the goals of the DCIA to maximize collections while minimizing the cost of the government in that effort. We carry out the statutory responsibilities effectively and efficiency, efficiently with seriousness of purpose. Collecting debt is part of our core mission. I think we are one of the few government agencies that has, if maybe the only agency that has, debt collection as part of its core mission. Uh, we are constantly looking for ways to improve our activity, our, our efforts, and the centralization of, of, of collection of, of debt owed to the Federal Government. And I will go into a little bit later some of those efforts that we have ongoing right now to do even better than what we have been doing in the past. The DCI requires agencies to refer most of their debts to the FMS with 180 days of delinquency. We encourage agencies to refer debts to us sooner. Uh, we, do, we have two major mechanisms with which we collect the debt. One is something called the Treasury Offset Program which is effectively a, a means of matching Federal payments against delinquent debt files. So it is a au highly automated, highly efficient process, uh, the premise being that we shouldn't be making payments to someone who owes debt to the Federal Government, and uh, the attempt is to intercept those payments before they are actually made. And as I mentioned, that is that's highly, a highly efficient mechanism. The second mechanism that we use is called cross-servicing, and that is more actively working the debts. Uh, we do things like uh, write letters to debtors. Uh, we refer debts to uh, private collection agencies. Uh, we refer debts to the Department of Justice for litigation. Uh, we use administrative wage garnishment uh, to attach the wages of work, uh, working debtors, and we report debts to credit bureaus. While we strive to collect the maximum number of dollars possible, we are also aware of the needs of the debtors to be treated fairly. We are mindful that not every debtor is financially able to repay their debts, and debtors are provided the appropriate due process rights allowed to repay debts over time. We take great care to protect the privacy rights of individuals and have a robust measures in place to guard the security and sensitivity of financial and private data. I am also part of our very core mission uh, and our values within our organization is that we treat debtors as we would like to be treated ourselves, and that is something that permeates all of our workers uh, in the process of their efforts. 
we recognize that we have to be serious and tough at times, but we also realize we need to treat people respectfully and, and, and uh, as we would like to be treated ourselves. Since 1996, FMS has collected more than $47.9 billion on behalf of the Federal and State agencies. We have collected $5.4 billion in delinquent debt in 2010, including $2.1 billion of delinquent child support. And in fact, that child support is something that, while we are quite pleased to help the Federal agencies of the United States Government, it does give us some sense of strong purpose of what we do is important and adds value to the American families and children. Uh, we are also on track this year to increase our collections over last year. We are ahead at this point. We are approximately 8 percentage. We are 8 percent uh, ahead of where we were last year at the same time and with respect to our collections. Uh, we expect to continue growth in the coming years, and we have a, a seven-point uh, strategy plan in order to increase those collections, which I would like to get into a little bit later, um, and we expect a, a strong period of sustained growth. We also have a couple of legislative proposals in place, which in totality will bring an additional $5 billion in collections to the Federal Government over the course of the next 10 years. One key area of delinquent debt I know of oftentimes of interest is Federal debt uh, owed by Federal employees. And since the passage of the Debt Collection Improvement Act, FMS has collected $340 million from Federal employees, including $277 million in delinquent tax debt. In 2010, FMS collected $85 million from delinquent Federal employees, an increase of 6.5 percent from 2009. The second area which has received a fair amount of attention recently is Medicare payments. Um, FMS intercepts Medicare payments to doctors, hospitals, and other providers who owe delinquent debts and, uh, and, non, and uh, delinquent tax and non-tax debts. Since 2008, FMS has collected $136 million from payments to Medicare providers who owe delinquent debts, including $107 million in tax debts. A third area that we have been uh, increasing our efforts is, is debts owed to States. Um, and we uh, have the ability to help States who I think are very much in need right now of revenues. So uh, we use the Treasury Offset Program um, as, as a way to collect funds on behalf of States. Uh, most recently, Kentucky just joined the program. And in the first week of the program, they collected close to $2 million. In the first month, they collected $4.7 million through the State Reciprocal Program. Um, we also most recently, based on legislation passed by Congress, are working to collect uh, State unemployment compensation debts, where there has either been overpayments or fraud in the unemployment program. New York uh, was one of the first programs to sign on to the program recently, and the first two days of the program collected $2.8 million. Wisconsin was the second State to sign on and collected $640,000 in its first day. So we see a lot of opportunity to help States and assist States in, in uh, fulfilling and meeting getting repayment for either overpayments or fraud in various programs that are out there. Um, I mentioned the seven-point strategy that we have at FMS to increase collections over the course of the coming years. Um, those strategies, um, I, I think, um, include increasing our call center capability. Last year we handled 4.3 million uh, calls from debtors uh, trying to resolve debts. Uh, we are implementing state-of-the-art collection tools. Uh, we are increasing the effectiveness and efficiency of our debt collection processes. And we are also reaching out and, and establish an agency council in which we can work with our sister agencies to improve and look at best practices uh, and sharing of more information to improve government-wide collections. Um, with that, I see I have just hit exactly seven minutes, so I will end where I started to once again thank you uh, for allowing me to testify in front of you. I want to emphasize again that uh, we are very proud of the role that we play in, in uh, providing essential services to the people and to uh, the Federal Government and we place great importance on demonstrating value to the American people and fulfilling these responsibilities. And we very much look forward to working with this committee to fulfill those responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I um, appreciate your, uh, your testimony as well as, again, your written information you have provided. Um, I will uh, start with a couple of questions myself. Um, and, um, you know, in fact, um, rather than starting myself, I am going to, because of being the one that was the last in the room, I am going to go to my ranking member first and then to my colleagues who have been very patient, and I am going to go last, actually. So, uh, Ms. Towns, if you are ready, I will yield to you for the uh, purpose of questions. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. But you don't have to punish yourself for being last. But um, let me, um, why is it that the government, after two years, um, delinquent debt um, is sort of um, you stop pursuing it. In the private sector, uh, it's seven or nine. I think it's seven years. Uh, so I mean, why would they be able to pursue it much longer than than the government? 
Well, in many cases, the government, for example, on student loan debt, it does not ever get extinguished. So the capability exists for the Federal Government to continue to pursue that debt uh, really through the life of a, of a debtor. Um, and as a result, we often talk about if uh, we are not able to collect that debt uh, during the working years, that as one reaches Social Security, we have the ability to offset Social Security payments up to a certain level to continue to collect on those debts. So those debts stay on the books for a long time. Um, there, are a, there are some debts um, that are actually, and there is maybe um, some distinction here, the Federal Government will write a debt off, uh, and that is really an accounting entity. Um, it, it basically, as an, in, in the accounting purposes, you are required as an entity to say what is the fair value of an asset or liability on your books. Um, it doesn't mean that we stop collecting the debt. Okay? So there is a distinction there, which is you can write something off and show on your books that it has a value of, let's say, 10 cents on the dollar. On the other hand, we as a Federal Government will continue to collect on that, that debt and hopefully collect 100 cents on the dollar uh, unless it has been written off entirely as not collectible. So a fairly small percentage of the numbers. So if you look at the numbers, I think that is roughly $25, $25 billion has been written off, but only about $4.5 billion has been considered not collectible and truly um, extinguished as no longer being uh, pursued for debt collection purposes. And that is usually something that someone has been in bankruptcy uh, and is no longer, uh, the entity no longer exists uh, and therefore is, is not, not being collected against. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I understand that direct and guaranteed loans account for most of the delinquency. At education department, the SBA and the USDA. Uh, these loans are no doubt necessary because they are often made when private sector, uh, of course, uh, credit is unavailable uh, or maybe inadequate. And a Federal objective needs to be achieved. I understand that. You know, uh, for example, some education loans, <laughs> small business loans, and support for farmers. But what I don't understand is, uh, and can, maybe you can um, uh, explain to me, uh, the type of debt that is owed to Social Security Administration mm -hmm. and the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. I don't understand uh, why we would have loans there. Yeah. The, uh, the Social Security debt um, is really about overpayments. Uh, and so it is about improper payments and overpayments. And so what ends up happening is Social Security will work those, uh, those improper payments up to a point. When they no longer uh, have a sense that they can collect it up to that point, they will refer it to us and it becomes a delinquent debt. Uh, so there are situations where, um, uh, particularly in the SSI program, I think is the, which, which is income-based, there are situations where someone will have some income which will, have th will push them out of eligibility, and, but still, nevertheless, the payment has been made. Um, and so F SSA will go back and try to retrieve that, that, that overpayment. And if they can't, then it ends up in a delinquent debt portfolio. What about the Department of Defense? I'm less familiar with the, the, the delinquencies that are in DOD. I wonder whether I, I'm, I'm conjecture here. I, I wonder whether they're, they're uh, contract debts. I, I'm just not sure. Or they perhaps could be overpayments in, in some of the uh, medical programs, too. But I can look into that more fully for you. Right. We do that and yes. get back to us on it because I would just, I could understand the others, but those two, uh, and now that you explained the yeah. Social Security one, uh, are there a lot of uh, overpayment situations? Um, you know, it, Social Security? Um, I think every day uh, 3,000 people pass away. Um, and as a result of that, uh, Social Security has to have uh, systems which looks at, you know, are you, if you have been making a payment to someone for, um, you know, years on end, they are required to get that information and to stop those, you are required to re report that information immediately. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Uh, and there are various databases which they try to call to see whether they, whether there's, you know, they have actually captured that, that, uh, that payment that shouldn't be made. Um, but it is not a perfect process. And so I think those, and also in the case of SSI, uh, where the rules can sometimes be confusing about eligibility and non-eligibility, you can have situations where there's the overpayments. Right. Who's sort of responsible for notifying Social Security that the person has expired? What's it, the process? It is the family um, that's required to report it uh, um, immediately to Social Security. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Uh, Mr. Ginta. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, uh, and thank you, Mr. L Commissioner Liberick, for being here. I have a few uh, specific areas of, of, of concern. Uh, first of all, could you just let me know uh, what area for FMS provides the most challenge uh, 
the greatest challenge in terms of debt collection? Is there any one area that is more difficult than another? Um, the Debt Collection Improvement Act has been enormously successful in getting agencies to participate. In the early years, and some of the hearings we had with Chairman Horn at that time was really, really getting tough on the agencies because they weren't referring debts to us. Um, I think that process has really, um, we have had a success there in terms of agencies now referring debts to us for the most part at the 180 days. We also, some of the early years, had challenges getting all the payment streams in. So DOD makes payments and the Postal Service makes payments. And we had some challenges making sure those payment streams are being offset. Um, and that, by that process now, I think, is working very, very well. I, I wouldn't necessarily point in one, any one particular area except to say that I think that we are not as sophisticated in the government as we should be with respect to how we are looking at delinquent debt. The private sector is much further along than we are right now in looking at how you work debts in the portfolio. So when I mentioned the seven strategies earlier about where FMS thinks that we need to go, um, we need to do a better job of, of analyzing the debts and which debts are more collectible, um, a better job of, of, which is debt scoring, a better job of making sure when we have partial information that we have the capability of cleaning that information up in an automated fashion. Um, I think that there are other practices that the agencies could be doing, which we need to be working with them on the pre-180 day about how do you interact with a debtor. Well, that is right now, you don't see it until 180 days. How come you wouldn't? What's, what would be the agency process uh, for the mechanism at 60 or 90 days? They would have their own internal processes. In the, and I think, if, to, to, to answer your first question, I think that there is a lot of opportunity for agencies to be more scientific and disciplined in what they are doing pre 180. Um, and, and, and part of it, what I would say, I, this gets to the, I think the value of the DCIA and centralization is. You know, we think about this every day. You know, that is our job. We, we think about debt collection practices and how you are going to manage your, your, your debt portfolio. Um, I don't necessarily think that it is probably as widespread across government that that is their core mission. So I think that there is a lot of opportunity to do a better job on that in that pre-180. And as you, as, as for obvious purposes, the sooner you try to collect the debt, the better chances you have of collecting it. And then when you write off uh, does it vary when you are going to write that debt off based on your, your assessment of, of the likelihood of collection, or is it just at a date and certain you are essentially writing it off? OMB encourages agencies to write off debts at, at two years. Um, and as I mentioned, though, from uh, and there is a distinction there, which is writing off is different than stopping collection right. activity. So um, we, you know, really those that are being really written off in sort of what our sense of the word written off means is a fairly small percentage, and that is usually in the case of either bankruptcy or the entity doesn't exist anymore and you can't really go after anything anymore. But that is happening at the two, roughly at the two-year mark for that uncollectable written off debt? Um, I, my, I don't know this for certain, but my guess is if you really went back and looked at it, it is probably happening further out than two years, that, that agencies are continuing to hold these things for a long period of time and, and, and really doing everything that they can and really probably in a, a much longer period of time are actually making that assessment, unless they know for a fact that the entity no longer exists or the person doesn't exist. And then do you have uh, data on a, a one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year debt and, and the, the ratios at which you are collecting and the costs it is for us and for the agency for that collection at those different periods? Um, one of the seven strategies is for us to have better analytical capability in looking at the debts. And uh, we have some rough information about that, but not information that, I, that gives me a lot of confidence that I can say that this is the percentage that we are doing at, at, uh, at 180 to 360. Uh, I think we need to do more work in that area, and that is one of the areas that we are applying more resources with FMS to really help agencies understand that better. I think it would be fair to say that if we could do <clears throat> uh, improve the collection rate anywhere between the 60 to 360, mm -hmm. we would probably have a greater percentage of, 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 of debt uh, collected, and you would have a, obviously a, a, lo a lower write-off. Obviously, you are spending the best are you maximizing our resources at the earlier period. So anything that can be done to, to improve that and, and, and allow agencies, uh, whether it is educating agencies or whether it is um, you know, an oversight issue uh, for us, uh, I mean, please you know, feel free to convey that so we can uh, give you the tools that you need to, to, to improve in those particular areas. Thank, Thank you. you. We have um, looked at private sector experience in this area on consumer debt, which is a little bit different than some of the debt that we have. And it's your, 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 your assessment is absolutely right that 
um, when you are working that debt in that 60, 90 to 180 day period, you have a much higher chance of collectability than when you are working that debt in the two year or the three year time frame. Um, so, so I think you're, you, that, that, that's something that we've been talking to the agencies about is whether there's instances where they should be referring it to us sooner for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ginta. Uh, Dr. Gosar. Yes, thank you. Um, I kind of want to go back to uh, what you said to uh, my colleague, Mr. Ginta. And the cross-servicing program is used by agencies required to report that delinquent debt to the Treasury for, rough, for recovery efforts. In FY uh, 2010, Treasury was able to recover roughly about $123 million out of $107 billion. Um, can you tell me why that is so low? I mean, we are talking about a penny on the dollar. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the two programs that we have, um, and uh, one is the offset, the automated offset. So that full amount that you referenced, 107, is actually uh, being hit against uh, offset, the payment streams, and that is where you are getting a, a high bulk of that $5.4 billion that we collected. For a variety of reasons, um, we don't use cross-servicing on the full amount. And part of that is, is there are a number of exemptions that apply that don't allow us to do cross-servicing on all the debts that are referred to us, and that is the active uh, working of those debts. Uh, and so there are a variety of exemptions that include um, bankruptcy, forbearance, um, debt in litigation. Um, there is also an important category that uh, while you have that number of 104 is, there is approximately 36 billion of it which is being cross service at education and HHS. So while the number I am going to tell you is that we are only working at cross servicing on, the, on that portfolio around $14 billion, it has gone up a little bit in the last couple of months, now closer to 16, um, education is, is working 36 billion of that um, through, through their cross servicing mechanisms that they have on student debt portfolio. They collected last year close to $600 million uh, on that portfolio. So there is another number that is there. Mm -hmm. Second thing which I would say is, is that um, we, we only report what we captured in cash. Uh, and so one of the things that we are very on our cross-servicing program is administrative wage garnishment. So when you look at administrative wage garnishment and repayment agreements, there is roughly another $500 million that we have in the pipeline that we are getting bits at a time. Uh, whether they be payments that are being done on a monthly basis or uh, along the way from a, from a debtor. Um, so there's there's some success there, and the final reason is the the nature of federal debt. It's not great debt, um, and we're oftentimes the 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 last resort of people getting loans that they can't get someplace else. So the collectability on that portfolio is much lower than it would be if you had a better quality of debt. For example, consumer debt in many ways has a higher collectability than much of the debt that we have, given the nature of our debtors. Isn't there a way that we could report that then? I mean, it seems to me like you, you want to itemize this. If, if I am looking at delinquencies, so I want to look at if I have got a payment plan, shouldn't I have a number that I am looking at that are in payment in lieu that are up to standard? And th yes. that, help, that gives me another pr a parameter, because if I have got you know, uh, payments coming in lieu of, then I don't have to spend as much time into that area. It is just yes. a maintenance type issue. Then I can concentrate my efforts more into the other areas of, of the problem. And it seems to me like um, the advantage would be to share all this information start to finish, not at 180 days. Am I right? Uh, the, uh, the sharing the information with respect to all that, yeah, it should be interagency should be this should be real time watching this and 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 uh, it's no different than the private sector is is looking at this you know categorically across the business. Yes, what's it coming from this area, this and there, and this area, and we can concentrate it. Many hands make light work. Yes, uh, and and that's one of the reasons when we when we go through our seven strategies in terms of analytical tools, th this is some area which I think there's a lot of work that can be done within the federal government that we're pursuing, and that is looking at that portfolio and saying which debt has a greater likelihood of collectability than another debt. And also I think the, a very important set of tools that we have in place right now, what we are putting in place right now is we have something called partial matches. Um, and uh, if a debt comes in that says John Q. Public that lives on Main Street and the payment file says John S. Public on Main Street, we kick that debt out because it is not, we are not 100 percent sure it is the same person. Um, we now have more automated tools in which we can say John Q. and John S. living at the same address are probably the same person. Um, so we should be doing that offset rather than what we are doing right now is returning that debt to the agency and saying you need to clean it up. Um, and so the centralized value of that is that we, FMS, can be doing a better job of that in the front end. 
Last year, there were close to 150,000 partial matches. Um, we are estimating that if we were able to clean those partial matches up, that we would have $100 to $200 million more in collections simply by doing that. Um, and so that's, this is my point about us being smarter and more analytic and, and using more modern tools to do the things about segmenting that portfolio and working it in a more disciplined way. Yeah, one more question. Yeah, sure. um, you know, um, when I am looking at your chart in regards to delinquent uh, collections, particularly of the $47.9 billion, within you are collecting 48 percent of that is delinquent child report, uh, support. Mm -hmm. How much of that has actually been in, in dialogue with law enforcement? support with law enforcement? Because I know in Arizona it is huge. I yeah. mean, that is where we are getting a lot of, of, of delinquent child support being picked up. Yes. Um, the, we're, we do the child support program on behalf of the States. Um, and so the child support obligations that we are collecting for are State obligations. And so with respect to when the State or the locality is working with local law enforcement, it would be done at that level rather than at the Federal level. Okay. One last carryover. Um, Sorry about that. No, no. Okay. Um, do you prioritize each of these debts? Like, you know, in, in, in the private sector, we look at low hanging fruit, um, what is the hardest to get? Do you prioritize and which one do you find easiest, which do you find the, the worst? Um, and, and the answer right now, we treat all debts equally, which is not the right answer. There you go. Okay. Um, so. And uh, what we really need to be doing right now is looking at that portfolio more systematically and strategically and saying, what is the low hanging fruit? Do we have a proposal from you that is how do we prioritize that? I would love to see that. It is. And, and it, it comes down to uh, the tools that we are putting in place right now. Um, and the tools, uh, one of the tools is actually looking at the portfolio and doing debt scoring uh, and, and, and saying, okay, you know, this, you know, based on these characteristics, you have a much greater likelihood of collecting this kind of debt uh, than you would another kind of debt. And your efforts should be, would be more useful spent here than it would be like we are doing right now, which is everything is the same. So we, we chase a lot of dead ends right now. Right. And, can, and, and when you are doing that, can we also see the percentage, what our costs are? I mean, you know, as a consumer, you know, and advocating for the consumer, we would like to see what the costs are to recover. And yes. sometimes you are spending a lot more than you are actually getting in return. And we have right. got to be more fiscally responsible. Thank you. The, the one thing which I would say on that last point is I, one of the, we're, we're very proud of this statistic, which is for every dollar that we spend on debt collection, we return $53 in collections. That, that's the efficiency element that we're very proud of. Um, uh, which is a pretty good return. Um, but you but, can get better, right? But we can get better. And that's yeah. exactly where I was that's exactly where I was going to. We can do better than that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kosar. And uh, you, you, you earned the extra time by your patience in my late <laughs> arrival. So uh, yeah. uh, I will yield to myself now. And, and um, Commissioner, again, appreciate your, uh, your work and your staff and, and the serious approach that you are taking. Um, I guess the initial question I have is just when you look at your numbers and you, sh you shared in your testimony where you jumped 7.3 uh, percent from 2009 uh, and 67 uh, percent over the years back to 2005, if, if you had to point to you know, most significant change or actions that resulted in that 67 percent jump, what, what would, you, would you reference? Everyone's playing together now um, in a way that they were not playing. Um, you know, and maybe that's, maybe that's meaning right. departments and agencies, or or internally within the, your department, or across the, uh, the the spectrum of the federal government. I think maybe it's a let me actually say better. Everyone's hitting stride now, um, and and you know I would just say that uh, we now are getting the payment streams in that should be in. We're getting the debt referrals that we should be getting in, and I think that plays a significant role. Um, I also think that the amount of delinquent debt has grown, too. So there is an element there of there is more volume um, to, to go against. But I also think it really speaks to, this is why I think we are really at a stage to go to another level now. I think that we have got a very strong infrastructure in place to, to do what we need to do, uh, and now we need to be smarter yep. with what we are doing. And, and that goes to Dr. Gosar going from $52 for one to yes. $60, 70 right. yeah, sky is the limit, right? Uh, um, we appreciate that you reference uh, a number of uh, specific legislative proposals, um, and uh, both pretty straightforward, both on the 100 percent collection, uh, you know, on uh, basically uh, vendor payments, federal contractors, Medicare providers, and then also um, to assist with state collection, uh, being able to, to uh, collect even if the person is now residing outside the state they owe. Um, I guess the first question on those proposals is, uh, those aren't new. Uh, I know they were in the, I think, the 011 budget proposal as well. Um, 
what would be the uh, and, and one, I know uh, our committee staff, we have started working with your office on legislative um, efforts along this, uh, the route of these proposals. What would you say would be the biggest opposition to those proposals? And, and what have you heard, if anything, for those who don't support either of those? Um, the legislative process is never easy. Um, and one of the things that we have learned over the years is that um, we have frequently submitted legislative proposals in multiple years, and they ultimately get done, um, but they, they tend to get done over time. Um, so um, I, I really would be surprised if there would be a, a lot of opposition to either of those two, except from those who are delinquent on their Medicare or contractor obligations, because they do make a lot of sense. Yep. Um, and and uh, I agree. And, and uh, again, we look forward to working with you and your office on trying to speed up that legislative process a little bit. And um, in the 011 budget proposal, there were some additional legislative proposals. And, and I don't believe they were accomplished yet, uh, at least not all. And um, do you, do you want to highlight any of those additional proposals that we should have on our radar in addition to the ones specifically in the 012 uh, proposal? One of the things is, is dealing with incentives. Um, and I think uh, for the most part right now, when a, uh, a debt is delinquent and we collect on it, um, the fee that is attached to that, whether it be from the private collection agency or the fee that we charge, um, is added on to the debt. Um, there is an incentive, a negative incentive uh, for Medicare debt in which that uh, fee <coughs> is actually is not legally el eligible to be taken added on to the debt, and therefore either has to be absorbed by the trust fund or by the appropriated monies from the agency. That is a real negative incentive for, in, for referring debts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that um, for, for, for Medicare yeah. referring it yes. uh, to you because of, of the yes. cost to Medicare since they can't recoup it. That is right. Okay. Uh, and that, that, would, that would be one. I think, I, I think um, other than that, uh, we we've, we've made some progress on some of those other ones. I think some of the other ones have actually made moved through several committees, and we're hoping that they will come to a conclusion um, in in the in this session. On on the fee that is, uh, what what type of fee or amount roughly is it a percentage of of the debt? There are two fees that potentially could be uh, attached to that. One would be our offset fee, which is the roughly seventeen dollars per offset. The other fee is, if we refer it to a private collection agency, the, the, uh, the fee is usually around 28 percent or so on that. And, and that is what is being paid to once you get to a PCA? Exactly. Okay. Right. That is the, the and, and, and we, we, we uh, on most other debts, we, um, uh, uh, we add that on to the debt. So if there is a $100 debt, it becomes a $128 debt, and, it's, and the debtor is the one bearing the responsibility. On, on Medicare debts, presently, that is not the case. Okay. Um, get one more question here and, and go to another round for, for members if they like. The, um, on administrative wage garnishment, uh, in your testimony you talk about the uh, 25 agencies that are participating now, um, and um, you continue to work with non-participating agencies to encourage. I guess my question is, why isn't everyone participating? Uh, you know, why why aren't they taking advantage of this opportunity to collect what's owed their agency, the American people? This is one of those areas where, um, as we've gotten more mature in the Debt Collection Improvement Act, um, it's clear that there are barriers for the agencies to do their work. Um, administrative wage garnishment has a uh, there is a sense, right or wrong, that you need to go to a court in order to get that garnishment. One of the things the DCIA did said that the Federal Government can, uh, can do an administrative wage garnishment without a court. Now, you have to allow a hearing if someone wants to appeal the amount owed or whether their ability to pay. That has turned out to be a, a barrier to the agencies, uh, that they don't want to, they, they are either, um, it is not part of their core mission. You, you know, they are not going to want to set up hearings like that, and they are not, not, uncomfortable with the administrative wage garnishment process. So, and, 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 and that hearing process is individual to every agency? Yes, it is. It is. And, and so one of the things that we are looking at FMS is whether we should be providing it as a centralized service to, to remove that barrier to use of administrative wage garnishment. Um, I think Chairman Horma is looking at the, that the record, you know, said that, you know, from his perspective, any um, debtor who had an income stream um, should be subject to some sort of agreement before they are made a payment by the Federal Government. And when he, when he was talking about the administrative wage garnishment um, uh, provision, 
And I think there is a lot of validity to that, um, that, that we should be doing more as a federal, agent, as federal government. The other thing that has happened right now is that we have left administrative wage garnishment with each agency, so they have to put a regulation in place in order to mm -hmm. do the program. Um, which we have given them a model language and we provide it to them, and they can, you know, it's, it's something that is fairly easy for them to do, but nevertheless, it is a hurdle. Um, so I think that our ability to provide more of a centralized service and this is something which is an area that is worth exploring more fully. Yeah, and I, I would encourage that because it, it would make sense because it is it, going to vary by some agencies like Department of Ed having a lot of debt, you know, that they are relating, you know, may, may relate to student loans. Yes. Uh, but another smaller department agency having a small uh, amount of debt or, or not that often, perhaps, um, to have their own administrative hearing process versus a centralized. I, I think that is something where you know, Treasury could play an important role and that we get everybody participating. And there is a second piece on that that um, we have found in our own dealings is, is that if a file doesn't have good information in it, it is hard for the agency to track that information down. So if you are looking for a good phone number, you are looking for a good address, um, and one of the areas where we think we can provide a more centralized service is providing that service to agencies, saying if you are looking for a debtor, you can run it through our process so that you can find that person, get a phone number, get the information that you need in order to move forward more, more efficiently. Yeah, and having just sat through the hearing with GAO on the duplicative programs, that the Federal Government has from uh, from last week at the full committee, uh, I think it's a good example. You know, whenever we can eliminate uh, administrative overhead by, you know, eliminate duplication, we want to, and, and these are areas I think would be very helpful. Right. So, um, you know, uh, Mr. Challenge, do you have other questions? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, just thinking in terms of the Social Security um, uh, overpayment. Uh, I guess the first thing, would you need additional legislation uh, to support above and beyond what you have already proposed? And the reason I ask that question, uh, why couldn't we ask the undertaker to give the Social Security number when the person expires? Uh, Social Security does maintain a, a death database or a post-death database. How does that work? Um, I am not familiar, um, although what I, I, I want to get, I do know that uh, they, they did uh, look at the exact proposal that you were referencing, and that is should the uh, funeral homes be required to submit the data to a, a database. And they, they did a pilot uh, a couple of years ago in which they actually paid the funeral homes for the information they, every time they submitted the information. I think what they found in that point was that they didn't have the money to continue with that, and that if, in fact, it was required, you could have a more, so, so getting to your point, you could have a, a much better database, a more perfect database, which would go a long way toward avoiding those payments to someone who shouldn't be getting it. Um, and so I think it is an area that deserves um, further attention. Yeah, because I think just leaving it to the family, you know, to report, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to work, you know, I mean, uh, uh, to be able to cut down on the overpayments, right. and, you know, I'm sure. And I just also, to clarify one other point, the, the financial institutions also uh, report back into the system as well if when someone has been deceased. So if they are aware of the information from a bank, it will come back in as well. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. The other thing is that you, you mentioned state-of-the-art tools. What do you mean by state-of-the-art tools? There is um, much more. The private sector has done a lot more with uh, segmentation of the portfolio, um, different uh, mechanisms and tools that are more effective than others of, of how you actually reach certain debtors. Um, but also um, more, I think, to the point is that business intelligence tools and looking at databases and mining those databases for certain characteristics is an area that, that the private sector is doing a lot more of than what we are doing in the Federal Government. Um, and um, it is an area which I think has a lot of opportunity for us to be doing better. So it is really looking at these databases and looking at lots of different data and saying there are, there are certain debtors here with certain characteristics um, that um, uh, would lead us to believe that we have more collectability on one kind of debt or another. It is also those automated tools I mentioned to you before about when a debt comes in and the information may not be perfect. Can you, in a highly automated way, clean that data up more effectively about addresses and phone numbers and those kinds of things within the file? And the private sector is much more advanced. I would also say that with respect to um, our working in the cross-servicing side, 
that we should be more uh, systematic in scripts that we are using, so that when a, when a collector is uh, working a, a, a list of debts, um, that they are that they're given the information in an automated fashion, so when they, the automated phone call is made or the automated outreach is made, that they have, based on that debt, they have scripts that they are using to be more efficient in how they are collecting the debt, so they are not spending 10 minutes on a debt when they really, the, that the better way would be to spend one minute on that debt if they are more concise and disciplined in that approach. So those are the kinds of things that we are looking at in terms of our call centers and our opportunity to collect debt and those, those state-of-the-art tools. Do you need additional legislation support, legislative support you know, above and beyond what has been proposed? Do you need additional? For the moment, I would say no. Um, and I do think, however, that there um, that as we pass the 15th anniversary of that Collection Improvement Act, that there is opportunities for us to discuss whether there is more that can be done more generally. Um, so we don't have anything more than what we have in the 12 budget, um, but we are always looking at the 13 budget and we are looking beyond about other ways that we might be able to have other pieces of legislation that would help us. And we are happy to work with the committee on that. All right. Thank you very much. On that note, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, no. Uh, Ms. Norton, did you have any questions for the witness? Not at the moment. Okay, thank you. I, I've got a long list, so <laughs> I'll yield back to myself. Um, on the, um, the reciprocal um, arrangements with States, and, and you referenced Kentucky and uh, being the newest one and, and you know, how quickly they uh, reaped the benefits of participating, I, I wanted to make sure I understood um, uh, the process. States that are beyond the four that are currently signed up, uh, are we still you know, collecting uh, debts for any that are not signed up to help us collect Federal debt? Our, our terminology gets complicated, um, but we are actually collecting State income tax debt for States, uh, for a lot of States, more than those four. So um, we, are, we do have, uh, on the State income tax side, there is work that is being done for when a, when a, a Federal uh, income tax payment is made that it can be offset and given back to a State. Um, the State reciprocal program gets a little bit more narrow and allows, oh, I'm sorry, it broadens what we can, it, it broadens the um, types of payments that we can offset. So we include vendor payments at that point um, mm -hmm. so that the State can uh, participate that way. And vice versa, we actually um, collect in, uh, debts from the, uh, from the States. We collect, we collect them from, from the States when they are making payments. So it is reciprocal. We, do get, we both get uh, benefits from the arrangement. <coughs> Once they are participating in, in that program. Yes, they are. Um, currently, though, uh, there are States that were collecting um, State tax, income tax owed. Yes. And sending it back. I will use Pennsylvania, uh, my home State. Um, but Pennsylvania is not collecting Federal income tax owed to us from any payments they are making. Uh, right now, I think that um, we, we did do a, a, a test run with uh, Pennsylvania and found that if they were participating in the State reciprocal program uh, using vendor payments, I think that they could collect additional 29 to $30 million a year uh, based on that program. I do believe, uh, and my staff can correct me if I am wrong, though, that we are, we are actually um, doing state, we are doing offset on, on tax uh, information with the State of Pennsylvania right now. And I don't know what that number is in terms of what has been sent back that but way. I, I guess what I am focused on is if, if we are helping States out, whether they are in the reciprocal program or not, yes. with their State income tax, um, you know, it sounds like we are still helping them. Yes. Collect State income tax, even if they are not helping us collect Federal income tax. I believe that is correct. Um, they can correct me if I have got that wrong. Um, they are shaking their heads, yes, <laughs> that I have it right. Good. Okay. Good. I, I, I think. Yes. <laughs> IRS does that. Correct. Yeah. Um, I would say that on the State reciprocal last year, I think of the two States that were participating at that time, I think that we sent $16 million in their direction and they sent $12 million in our direction. So there was, that was. Yeah. When, I, I think getting all the States participating would be great. And if they don't want to, um, then they need to understand, I guess, what I am getting after is that we are not going to keep helping to collect State debt right. if they are not going to help collect Federal debt. Right. You know, so they have an incentive to be part of the, the, uh, the program. Yes. And I don't know within the Department if you, know, uh, if you have that authority to send that message or if that is something we need to look at legislatively and saying, hey, you, you know, hey, that you can go to the State saying, as of 
a year from now, we are not going to be able to help you unless you help us, yes. and something may, maybe we want to look at. Okay. Um, on, on the things, uh, I guess certain types of debt that are exempt from participating top or the cross-servicing, I notice one of them is debts owed by foreign so uh, sovereigns. Um, and what, can you expand on that and, and what type of debt would be owed us by a foreign sovereign and what type of payment will we be making that we couldn't then attach even though they owe us money? Um, I, I will have to get back to you on that one. I don't know the okay. nature of the debts that are in there. Yeah, I just, you know, our, our focus is about, you know, Americans that owe, uh, you know, a debt and we are trying to collect it. Well, if there are foreign entities that owe America a debt, they shouldn't be getting a payment from us for something else, um, in, in my opinion. Uh, and so if we could look into that a little deeper, that would be great. Okay. I'm going to catch up in my notes here. The mistake when I, you, I get the testimony ahead of time, it gives me less time to review and <laughs> make notes in my blue pens. Uh, um, on the issue of debts that are you know, not going to be written off, um, how do you go about, and it is kind of addressed a little bit earlier, but in determining, I mean, obviously some you know, death, uh, you know, uh, the person is deceased, the, the, the debt is not going to be collected, but in other ones where you reference um, financial hardship or other reasons, what, how do you assess that to say, hey, no, we are going to give up and, and you know, as uh, uh, Mr. Towns referenced, you know, two years versus, hey, we are going to keep it and four years from now, hey, that person who is having hardship might be in the money now and, hey, we still want them to pay, their, pay what they owe. Um, we rely heavily on the program agency to make that determination, uh, in part because, uh, in large measure, because they are more familiar with the program characteristics and as well as the debt is actually on the agency's books. So they are the ones who are ultimately responsible for the debt. Okay. Um, so we have not spent a lot of, we don't, we don't really get behind what those decisions are, other than that we know that they are usually based on bankruptcy or, or, uh, or the entity no longer existing. The, um Give me one second here. Uh, on the, uh, the report that was submitted uh, about your debt collection efforts, mm -hmm. um, in there it, it references in the executive summary that you are in essence reporting what uh, the head of each Federal agency provides you uh, to then compile in essence and you know, then forward to, to Congress. Um, are there agencies that are not complying and, and not providing their debt collection effort information to you? The good news is we feel pretty good that we are getting most of the, of the debts that are referred to us. Um, we, I think it is hard for us to say that we are getting 100 uh, percent, because every now and then we learn about some part of a program that is not being referred to us. Um, our agency council that we are establishing, that is uh, you know, one of the areas where we want to make sure that we are that, that we're working with agencies more closely to make sure we understand that they really are referring all the debts that, are, that they should be referring to us. Um, but as I said, that it's one of, the, one of the great success stories of DCIA is that in the early years it was very difficult to get the referrals to us. It referrals to us uh, for a variety of reasons, whether the, the debts were in the right format, whether they were documented the right way, uh, whether we had the automated systems in which to transfer information. Uh, and we really made a lot of progress in that area. Um, I wish I could say I would. I could say with, a, with complete confidence that we're getting 100 percent. I know we're doing pretty well. We're we're, we're up in the high 90s. Um, I can say that with some degree of confidence. But whether we're getting every single one, I, I think there's some more work that we can do on that. But um, I, I'll wrap up, and then if uh, Ms. Norton, I'll yield in just one moment. The um, as you're working with departments and agencies, if um, if they are reticent for whatever reason to cooperate and participate, uh, and uh, either in uh, being more proactive on the um, uh, wage garnishment uh, or just in providing the information in a timely manner to you to uh, pursue, um, you know, this subcommittee certainly stands ready to bring some uh, added leverage to your efforts. Uh, I know you are, as a, a department, kind of a peer department agency to, to many of these entities. Um, but sometimes uh, just the fact that, you know, um, the subcommittee is interested in looking at a certain agency that they are not fully going after debt 
uh, as they should be, we, we're glad to do that. And, uh, and again, in a, in a partnership way, that we just want to make sure we're all on the same page and, and doing. You know, I, I, um, probably, uh, maybe not the only, but one of the few that you know, paid my last student loan to the Federal Government uh, you know, as a member of Congress. Uh, and it took 11 years, but we, uh, my wife and I didn't miss those payments because it was our debt and we were glad to fulfill it and it allowed us to um, advance ourselves. So we expect others to uh, fill their obligations as well. So uh, with that, I will yield to uh, the gentlelady from uh, the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. Well, Mr. Chairman, you weren't glad to fulfill it, but you knew that it was your duty to fulfill it. I, I actually, uh, I, I was glad to fulfill it so I could get it off the books and uh, you know, start putting that money towards my kids' education in the years to come. No, he, he knew we were going to have a hearing. <laughs> Uh, I, am, uh, I, I have a question about uh, doctors and, and Medicare. And there had been a, um, a, uh, the, a doctor who was delinquent, and I, I need to know what delinquent means, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Federal tax uh, obligations um, could have 15 percent of, of the payments withheld. And now there is a proposal in the 2012 budget for 100 percent. Mm -hmm. Now, for you know, at first blush, that seems uh, par for the course. You know, they're doctors; they ought to be able to pay their their uh, taxes. Uh, at, uh, on the other hand, there is huge concern in the Congress uh, about the uh, rapid attrition of physicians even willing to. <laughs> see Medicare patients. So I am obliged to ask you um, what your view is of this 100 percent uh, that would include uh, Medicare, apparently all contractors. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, on the face of it, the fairness of it is, is, is clear. But uh, uh, what do you think that would do for, for doctors who in fact, are seeing Medicare patients uh, getting, <laughs> they will tell you a few cents on the dollar, <laughs> getting very little, uh, so much, so, very little of what they believe they uh, are entitled to, and they will only point to uh, what, in fact, uh, they 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 can get if they if they jettison Medicare and take only people who are willing to come without Medicare, so much so that some elderly are willing uh, to, in order to keep their physicians uh, when they jettison Medicare to pay for, for, uh, for the entire amount themselves. So there will be many elderly who could not. Uh, what, what effect does, would this uh, 100 percent levy? First of all, what does the Lincoln mean? Do you think that the 2012 budget legislative proposal is in effect uh, now? Because it's a legislative proposal. I don't know if it's in the appropriation or what. Um, uh, the word delinquent uh, uh, is not clear to me. Uh, would you explain how one how this would operate? I'm particularly interested in Medicare doctors. I understand why they would be folded in with other contractors. Uh, but but I'd like to know what kind uh, what 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 um, uh, what what delinquency uh, would would uh, in fact uh, result in um, this um, hundred percent, and what effect do you think it would have on uh, Medicare providers willing to continue to provide Medicare to the elderly? Um, thank you. We're, we're very supportive of the proposal. Um, it would, would yield uh, close to $750 million over the 10-year period, which is a sizable amount. With respect to the underlying uh, program issues, um, as we, we why, why was it at 15 percent? That didn't work. Did the 15 percent, which does seem to be a fairly low amount, uh, wh why, why, was, why, why was the, the, the number uh, increased from 15 percent to 100 percent? Um, I suspect it has to do with the uh, $750 million over 10 years. <laughs> Somebody which was, wanted the money. Which, which was, is the ability to collect the money sooner. And it was coming in too, 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 too slowly. Okay. Yeah. Um, with respect to delinquency, uh, uh, 
agencies and, and debtors have due process rights. So uh, to the extent that uh, an, a, a, a Medicare provider is, has a delinquency, they would be notified and have the ability to um, either have a hearing or some sort of discussion about whether that is the appropriate amount in which they are being uh, charged. They also have, in most cases, the ability to say whether it is financial hardship, whether the ability to repay, and whether there are other repayment agreements that they can get into along uh, to satisfy that delinquency. So even with this 100 percent, do you believe a physician could, could in fact, work, work, work out something with the IRS the way the average citizen does to pay a certain percentage, or would he nevertheless, because he is, quote, delinquent, uh, have to abide by the 100 percent? When we um, go through, we, we, in, at FMS, for example, when these debts are referred to us, we do oftentimes have compromise authority in which we work with the agencies to say, you know, is there a better way to collect this debt? Is there a, is there a more reasonable way to have either repayment agreements or some sort of mechanism to make sure that we have better collectability? Um, and that is always the process has to be working with the debtor to do that. Um, with respect to the impact on the program, um, one of the things which we don't have a lot of expertise in, uh, because there are so many programs out there, is the underlying purpose of a program and the underwriting standards that are given. So why a payment is made under what circumstances is not something that we at FMS or Treasury would have a very good feel for. Um, I would think a delinquent, uh, let's say, physician be one who had simply had ignored uh, the opportunity after a hearing to work out something for himself and finally gets on this list, the only way you can get the money is to get on this list to get 100 percent from you. Yes. Uh, and so when the debt is referred to us at 180 days, we will do a variety of things. Uh, we will then do a, a process of our own in terms of contacting the debtor and letting, making sure that they know that they are either going so to So he gets another it. chance. There is another chance on it, yes. Yeah. Um, and then we would be working with the agency, with the with the agency to say, you know, is this the right thing to be doing in this particular circumstance? Um, uh, once it's with now us, I take it since this was a, 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 this this is in fact the the law now. Is that the fact? The fifteen percent is the law right now. No, no, right? the two the hundred percent. When does that become effective? Uh, if the legislation passes. So it, so so th this is. It says this is proposed is not yet is not yet law. It is proposed legislation. But you all strongly support it. Yes, we do. <laughs> the administration strongly supports. Yes. It. Have there been hearings? Uh, I don't believe there has been. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Norton. The um, effort uh, in, in helping to move this legislation is something that we're very involved with and, and want to help make happen. And, and I think, and I apologize, didn't hear all the answer because of, 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 of uh, conversation here. But when we talk about Medicare providers, a type of debt that we're talking about, and you may have referenced this, and I apologize, is the, the story where you have a doctor who got student loans, paid their way through school with the help of American taxpayers, is out, you know, making a good or whatever income, but is not paying back those loans. Once that's discovered, Medicare can say, "All right, you're getting paid by the taxpayers." We're going to take some of that to pay off that debt you owe. That yes. that would be an example of, of a delinquent debt that a yes. doctor has. It's not related to their medical provision of services. It's related to the education they got. Correct. Or would it be tax debt? Yeah. In the case of a delinquent tax debt. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we're going to, uh, Ms. Trowns, did you have anything else? Just a quick question. Yeah. Just a quick one. Um, you know, we want to be helpful. I mean, uh, we not. I mean, I want you to know that. I mean, uh, in every way. But you know, I didn't feel comfortable with your answer uh, in reference to if a person moves from one state to another in terms of the collection process. Uh -huh. I didn't feel comfortable with your answer. Help me. <laughs> okay. Well, right now, which is there's a lot of what happens is is that we don't have the ability that if you incur a debt in one state uh, and then you move to another state because of certain restrictions, we no longer can actually pursue that debt, or the state can no longer pursue that debt uh, against someone who's moved from, let's say, Pennsylvania to New York. Um, and so, the provision that we're asking for is that you that you can, in fact, continue to pursue that person if they move to another jurisdiction. And the last part of that is that you know, in some instances, people <coughs> might not have the resources to pay at a given point, mm -hmm. but then at a later date they come into a lot of money or something, I mean, you know, uh, how do you deal with that? Mm -hmm. That is one of the reasons why very few debts are extinguished uh, in our process and why they stay in the database for a long period of time and will continue to be worked for a long period of time. 
Um, and uh, we, do, we do actually, and with respect to debtors who are in, under financial hardship, we do try to work out repayment agreements. We do try to make sure that we put terms in there. As I mentioned on the cross-servicing, you know, close to $500 million of, of repayment agreements are in there, and administrative wage garnishment um, orders are in there to allow us to collect that debt over a period of time. And administrative wage garnishment um, is a 15 percent, so you are not garnishing someone's entire wages, you are garnishing a percentage. Um, that uh, allows us to ke collect small pieces of that debt uh, until it is satisfied. Thank you. Um, we are going to keep the record open for uh, seven days. And, and I know two specific issues, one with the defense debt that mm -hmm. Mr. Towns referenced, and then uh, my inquiry on the um, uh, foreign sovereigns and, and how what type of debt we would be talking there versus payments that we are making to these foreign sovereigns. Uh, and if there is any other materials that you think would be relevant, um, uh, conclude with uh, one again a, a um, appreciation for your patience and, and my colleagues' patience with my late arrival, uh, and, and especially um, our um, interest in, in, in uh, willingness to partner with you and your your agency in uh, really improving the process to make sure that uh, what's owed the American people is uh, is paid and uh, that we uh, make sure you have the tools to be able to do that. So, Thank you for your leadership and thank you for allowing us to, part to, to testify today. No, cool. th thanks for being here. And again, uh, hearing, uh, the uh, record will be open for, uh, for uh, seven days and this hearing stands adjourned. Thank you. Sure. So,